Good afternoon, everybody. Just before I came up, I met very nice lady, and she probably knows that I was kind of uneasy. So she said to me, all your inadequacies, she said, will be turned into gold. I said, at that rate, there'd be an awful lot of gold around here. Um, Father Price asked me to say a few words on the Eucharist. Of course, that's the past that I'm not capable of, but I'll have a go with it anyway. When Jesus Christ on Holy Thursday was instituted in the Eucharist, he used an old Palestinian way of doing it. He used the bread and wine. The bread symbolized at that time in Palestine being well received. And the wine was to rejoice the heart. There is no greater gift that Christ could have given us than to give him thanks to us. He gives us because of his great love for us. His love and obedience to the Father was so great that he died to show us. He gave us the example of how to receive and cheer other people up. Pope Paul II, in his encyclical in the Eucharist, said that the Mass makes the sacrifice of the cross present to us. He said that it doesn't add to that sacrifice or it doesn't multiply it. It is just carrying on the sacrifice, the redemptive sacrifice that Christ offered once for us, so that it would be with us for all time. And Jesus said to his disciples, do this in memory of me. So it has been, Christ has been with us and we can receive him into our hearts at all times. The Mass, of course, is central to our Catholic faith. We have the Mass for all sorts of celebrations, from crowning a Pope, getting married, celebrating, offering Thanksgiving, and of course, it is said for us after all this. Mass is the center of everything for us. The Eucharist is central to all our lives, both for ourselves and for all those who come to us. At the Eucharistic prayer, the priest prays, the bread and wine will be transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And afterwards, we pray to the Holy Spirit that our lives too will be transformed. They will be transformed from selfishness and sinfulness and pride and ego into being loving, caring, giving humble people. One of my longest memories is as a very young child getting up extra early on Sunday morning because my parents had to milk the cows, feed the calves, and do a lot of work around the farm before we set out on the pony and trap for mass. At the early stages, I didn't understand much about mass. But for my mother especially, it was the highlight of the week. And we went in hail, rain or shine, 
for the frostbosty or snow. Indeed, I can often remember the pony slipping in the frost, but we went anyway. And for the time of the ma mass was in Latin, so to the time of silence and reverence. And as I learned to read, I thought I was really doing great. The more times I read my prayer book from cover to cover during Mass, the better I thought I was after attending. I can remember while coming home from school, after the parish priest had told me, even though I was very young, that I couldn't make my first communion. And I said to my mother, I'm making my first communion. The parish priest said it. And she said, you're too young, she said. You don't know what you're doing. Of course, I said, I know what I'm doing. If she was alive today and she said it to me, I would agree with her. Because there is no way that I recognize as I could or as I ought to what I am doing when I go to Holy Communion. The enormity and the wonder and the greatness of what takes place for us is hard to understand. I suppose when we were six and seven years of age, Father McVeary was talking this morning about our childhood. My sister and myself would be sent off every second Saturday at confession to our nearest parish church, which was about four miles away. So we walked it there and back. At that time, you had to go to confession every second week if you were to receive every Sunday morning. And my mother always had a list of people that needed to be prayed for, people who were sick, people who were in desperation, and various other intentions. And even though she was a very busy woman, she sacrificed the help that we could have given her on a, Sunday, on a Saturday morning to let us go to confession. She lived it, as well as living it in the Mass. Because I can never remember coming home from school. Hardly a single evening that she didn't hand me a little bag of some description and say, run away now and don't let anybody see you. It might be a cake of bread or a clean shirt or some sticks for the fire or whatever for somebody that needed it more than we did. It wasn't that we had an awful lot, but my mother always felt there was something to give away. And in the morning going to school, she always gave me a bottle of milk and a few other odds and ends for an old man who had given away everything he had and was left in a very poor condition. I know today that it was my mother's unconditional love and what she had taught us that is responsible for bringing Kumbhara into being. Because Kumbhara is all about unconditional love. It is about the goodness beauty, the giftedness, the wonder of each person. My father too would have helped because when things got bad in the early days in Kumbhara and when everyone opposed it and I asked for his advice, he said, why was I asking his advice? And then when I told him that everybody was a poster, he said, take no notice at all of all of them. And if I'm any judge, you won't go too far on. He gave me plenty space to make mistakes, knowing me as he did. Kumbha is our opportunity of living the Eucharist. Kumbha is Eucharistic. It is about being the face of Christ and all those who come to our door. I suppose one of the things I found hard about living in a convent was the fact 
that I couldn't bring home with me, the people that I met along the way who needed to go home somewhere. Of course, as the years went on, even in the early years, I did bring home many a person and hide them. That's if there's such a thing as hiding anyone in a convent. Um, Coonvera is there for anybody who needs it or for anybody who wants to reach out for help. Coonvera is the place where we have a tiny glimmer of the value of a human being. It's hard to understand like Father McVeary said, the value of a human being. Imagine one human being, no matter how bruised or broken, how ragged, how angry, how disturbed, how upset. No matter what their behavior might be, that one human being is more important and more valuable than every single thing in this whole world put together. No wonder we say to ourselves today, uh, where are things going wrong? Things are going wrong when material things have become more important than human beings. And when we're more worried about the economy then we are the welfare of our people. It is sad, really, what is happening in the name of progress. The very people who were the core and center of our country have had to close down their little shops and post offices and small businesses because they can't cope and they can't measure up the demands that are made on them from insurance and from hygiene and from all these other things. They were the people that people could talk to. They were the people who helped those around them who were in need. They were the people who were the core and centre of our country. But today we have gone towards bigger and better, supposedly better, firms and supermarkets and all these kind of things. Um, it is a great joy for those of us who work in Coenvera, to be able to live in a house where we have the privilege of bringing home at any time anyone we meet along the way. And it's great when you're out for a day and you see somebody on the street and you can welcome them home or at least invite them to come back with you. It never ceases to amaze me how people change when they discover and begin to discover who they really are, that they are in fact made in the image and likeness of God, that they have an unlimited capacity for goodness within them, and that there is no end to the giftedness that they have, and that they will discover it in a very simple way just by learning how to give it away to each other. Sister Helen, she's down there in the group, and she takes the second group, second week in the tie of the meetings. And she would tell you that the people when they're leaving Coonville, having discovered that power within them, they no longer feel useless or hopeless or no good. They know that they have found 
all that they will ever need to bring them through life without the use of alcohol or drugs. I worked in the drug unit for six years. As a matter of fact, I was very sad when I had to move from it. And I was amazed at the young people, a big number of them from the city of Dublin, who were suffering from heroin addiction. I was amazed to find their hunger for what is spiritual and what is good. Many of them may never have prayed for years, if they ever prayed. But they just took to the spiritual life like ducks to water. They always amazed me at night when they kneeled down to say the rosary. We said the rosary in all our houses at night time. And I decided in the early stages that we wouldn't have any trimmings because they could be added on and on and become longer than the rosary. But in the drug unit, we didn't make any such choice. And I definitely, when I was there, often had to wait five minutes, maybe more, before the rosary began because they made all their intentions known and they prayed for so many people before we even began the rosary. But they surprised me. No one could tell me today that our young people haven't, haven't a hunger for what is best. There is a calling within each and every one of us. That calling that St. Augustine talked about when he said, of course, St. Augustine had gone down the same road of addiction. Wine, women, and so on. And it took him a long time to come back. But through the prayers of his mother, Monica, he came back. Even though he came back reluctantly. We hear he said, Lord, make me pure, but not just yet. He was reluctant to leave that life behind him. But having it left behind him, he said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are ever restless until we find our rest in you. And I think that is the restlessness that is evident all over our world today. People are restless because they have moved away from God. Kumba is a great place to come back. Everything about it gives us an opportunity of being Eucharistic. We have the opportunity, as I said, of welcoming Christ in everyone who comes through the door. I remember as a young man, we were in the novership, we didn't see many people, except when we were doing portraits on a Saturday for an hour. And I always saw it as my chance, and I always hoped that a lot of people would call especially those who were looking for something to eat to our door, so that I could have the opportunity of meeting Christ in these people. I've always found it easier to meet Christ in another human being than any other way. We have all come here today to talk about the divine mercy, to experience the divine mercy, there are people here today, I'm sure, and their hearts are full of pain. There are people here who have come for healing, for themselves, for their families, for loved ones. There are people here today looking for answers. Sometimes there are no answers, but there is always love. Looking down at this great crowd of people, I have to say to myself, this is surely a great opportunity for all of us to reach out to each other, to be Eucharistic. We don't have to wait until tomorrow. There are many people here today that each one of us can cheer up with a smile, a kind word, a listening ear. Maybe that we can help someone in some way here today 
just by listening to them, by hearing what they have to say, by giving them a bit of guidance, by smiling at them. This is our opportunity because we today are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We have at our disposal all the power and the goodness and the giftedness of God himself. Let us not waste, let us not waste it. Let this be the day that will make a huge difference in all our lives. I said to myself last night, the Lord must have asked me to talk about the youth so that I might just sit back and be more aware myself of what I am talking about. Let this be the day that will change our own lives, all our lives. Let us the day when we say we are going to be forevermore living out the Eucharist that we are not going to miss out on any of the opportunities that are given to us. The opportunities that will never come our way again. I can remember saving up 10 shillings to buy a little pet when I was nursing in Cork. We were earning 30 shillings a month. And I saved up 10 shillings to buy this little pet. And I think it's as relevant for me to be as it could have been. I shall pass this way but once. Any good therefore that I can do, let me do it now. Let me not to or neglect it, because I will not pass this way again. We will not pass this way again. Thanks to Father Carl Price, we have the opportunity to be here, to pull our love, our healing, our friendship, the love of Christ himself running through each and every one of us. Just send it out to all those that we promised to pray for. To send it out to all those in need of our prayers. To send it to each other so that there will be healing and the love and the peace in this hall today like there never was before. And that when we go home to our homes tonight, that we'll bring a peace and a love and a healing in a way we never did it before. And that we will send out to all corners of the earth from this building today, healing and hope and love. Thank you. I meant to say to you, uh, we, we love Ted.